So, um, I want to. Okay, we're good. Now I'm just going to get close up on my left nostril. <laughs> the other day, that thing didn't come open all the way, and so I wanted to make sure it did. Um, today we're going to be talking about creating a personal devotional life, and I want to put this in the context of our class, which is how to study the Bible, okay? Um, today, creating a personal devotional life, which boils down to applying Scripture to your life. And then next week we're going to be talking about, in the first half, leading others in Bible study. The second half will be the exam. I encourage you all to take the exam. The notes are now up online, uh, so all of the things that you're going to need to know is going to be on that. And it's going to be very simple and straightforward, Joanne. Don't shake your head back there. <laughs> but uh, I think it'd be a good experience for you. And if you're taking it for just audit, it still will be helpful to, to do that. So today, I want to talk about building your devotional life. And I'm going to talk about how that differs from just a Bible study. Um, so what is a devotional life? I would define a devotional life as the spiritual discipline of Bible study prayer and meditation that is centered on God and is intended to improve our relationship with God and to make us more aware and more responsive to God's leading in our lives. Now, the difference is a Bible study, which is what this class is about, is the foundation. That's sort of the backbone of a personal devotional life. But by itself, Bible study is not sufficient. Okay? The reason I say that is because if we don't have a devotional attitude toward it, there are some of the least believing people in the world who are scholars in Bible. I mean, you could get a double PhD in some aspect of Bible, and unless you have a devotional that is a faith-oriented approach to the Bible, it really is not going to do you any good. In fact, you'd probably be miserable. It's almost like a person who is starving, and yet they specialize in beautiful food. Okay. Um, here we're talking about... Bible study and prayer and meditation as part of a devotional life. And so we're talking about going the next step with all of the things you've been learning here. What do you now do with all of this new technique that you've learned, if you will? What we're really talking about, a devotional life which is based in, in Bible study, the goal is for you to create a, a mental and spiritual grid through which you can pass all the things that you hear and see and think in order to determine what is of God and what is not of God. Rosie, you just said, if you had read this passage a week ago or however long ago, it wouldn't have meant anything to you. Well, the more you pursue not only Bible study, but also a devotional life and develop a personal devotional life, the more things mean to you in terms of God's perspective on them. You get the ability to evaluate things and it becomes much more natural. It does, at first, it takes some work. You have to really concentrate a little bit. But over a period of time, the devotional life builds Christian maturity in you so that you have the ability to make discreet judgments about things. When you hear something, to be able to evaluate, is that true or not? Is that right or not? Is that good or not? Because sometimes there are shades of gray, and the world will try to convince you of the wrong things. Well. Bible study is the foundation, but a full personal devotional life, what you do with that Bible study, gives you the ability to make those kinds of discrete judgments from a spiritual point of view. Um, so a devotional life is more than just Bible study, but Bible study is at the core of it. Fair? All right. Um, I would also say that creating a personal devotional life for yourself is one of the most important things you will ever do. It is one of the most significant investments that you will ever make in your life. It is an investment. It does require time. It does require effort, just like studying the Bible requires some time and effort. It's sort of an addendum. It's, a, it's an adding on to that Bible study. But if you do it, the result will be that you will learn to hear the voice of God more clearly, speaking to you specifically about the things of your life, you will have a greater sense of His presence and a greater sense of uh, guidance in all aspects of your life. You'll have a sense of what it is God wants you to do in virtually any situation if you develop this kind of personal devotional life, the spine or core of which is Bible study. Okay? Does that make sense? Well, let's talk about that. What are the principles of devotional life? I want to give you four principles that I believe are why this personal devotional life are critical. The first is, 
We are made for fellowship with God. And to quote St. Augustine, our hearts are restless until they rest in Him. We were not just made to go from cradle to grave and survive. And maybe somewhere along the line, make just enough of a profession of faith in order you know, to, to be saved. God wants us to be in a relationship with Him. That's why we were made. That's why we were made in the image of God. And more to the point, that's why Jesus died. Jesus died on the cross so that we, by having our sins forgiven, by having our sins taken on Him, we would be clean and therefore able to once again be in relationship with God, the place that we were made for, the relationship that we were made for. That the sense in which, as I've said many times, Every culture in history has had a sense that there's something wrong with us. There is something broken in human beings and humanity. The thing that is wrong with us is that we know down deep that something is missing, and that something is our communion and relationship with God, the Father. Jesus died in order for us to have that. Again, we were intended for it in creation. If we don't take advantage of that by developing a our relationship with God, by making an effort to have a relationship with God, there, there's an extent to which we are being cavalier about the nature of Jesus' sacrifice. If we say that, well, it's, you know, it's good enough that He saved me, I'm not going to take advantage of the very reason why He died, so that I could be back in fellowship with the Father, then I don't think we're taking the sacrifice of Jesus very seriously. So that's why I think this is important, that we take seriously the commitment to be in fellowship with God the Father. And the way we get there, I believe, is by a personal devotional life. The second principle is that fellowship with God, like fellowship with any person, and remember, God is a person. It's actually three persons. But person means he has a personality, he communicates, we can relate to him, we can have a relationship with him. Fellowship with God, like with any person, requires some effort. We must be willing to spend time together, to talk, to listen, to interact, to respond. You all know you cannot have a relationship with someone, spouse, boyfriend, girlfriend, child, friend, without ever having an investment of time and energy in it. You know, any, you talk to any counselor in the whole world who knows anything, and they'll say, well, if you want to have a more satisfying marriage relationship, for instance, you have to work at it. It requires some effort. Well, the same thing is true in our relationship with God. We have to be prepared to put some effort into it. There's got to be an intentionality. It does not happen by accident. The third point is that a devotional life is, as I said before, more than just a Bible study. That, um, but a Bible study is at the root of it, it's the core. That through the Bible, through studying the Bible, we begin to hear God's voice. Hearing God in Scripture is foundational. That's the reason God gave us this book, is because it's in there that He speaks to us. But if we, if we don't take it seriously and open it and study it and listen to it, then we are, we are bypassing the opportunity to hear God's voice and we are neglecting a relationship with God, the thing we were made for. And the fourth point is, in addition to Bible study and reading, a meaningful devotional life must include prayer, meditation, and life application. Now meditation, that word gets a bad rap. It's one of the basic Christian uh, disciplines. And next term starting in January. Our classes are going to be New Testament survey, New Testament theology, and Christian spiritual disciplines. And we will talk more about prayer and meditation and other things there. But suffice it to say that uh, prayer I'm going to get into in a few minutes. Meditation means that once you have read scripture, you ponder on it, you let it sink in, you consider the implications, you absorb it, and then you think about how you are to apply it. That meditation is a process of letting it soak in and let God say to you what He wants you to do with this, with what you have read, with what you, what you have experienced in prayer. That's what the meditation is. And then life application is what you do when you stand up. Okay, what do you do when you go away from there? What do you take from that? So those four principles, that we were made for fellowship with God, but, like any other kind of fellowship, it requires effort. It's more than just Bible study, although that is foundational, and it must include uh, prayer, meditation, and application in addition to Bible study. Questions? <coughs> just 
<laughs> just coughing. Usually when somebody coughs, it means they're not quite sure what to say. Just kidding. All right, let's talk about some practical elements uh, for a devotional life. What do you need to do? And, and let me start out by saying, well, I'll give you the first one, make, making the commitment. In the, especially the Catholic spiritual disciplines um, through the centuries, there's a concept that, that developed called the Vicari Deo. And this is something I've, I've taught about in prayer before. Vicari Deo literally means to be vacant for God. Or, more specifically, it means to be on vacation for God. It means to set aside time and say, Lord, this is your time. I don't have any other obligations. What do you want to do with this time? To make a commitment to have relational time with God. Well, excuse me, what is that called? Vacare Deo. V-A-C-A-R-E. Second word, D-E-O. Literally, on vacation for God. Thank you. That's the core of the, of the traditional spiritual discipline of the Catholic Church. Um, and it's a really good thing. And what's okay. the meaning of that? The, on vacation for God. On vacation. Right. Which means, I don't have other obligations. Remember, when you go on vacation, it means that you're going someplace where you can just set aside all the usual responsibilities and not have to bother about those things. Well, that's what this literally means, to set aside a time, to set aside a time for God. So the uh, making the commitment, the first step, is also the most difficult one, and that is you have to decide that you're prepared to do the most fundamental thing about having a personal devotional life, and that is to slow down and take the time that's necessary to do this, to be vacari deo, to be on vacation for God. This does not happen by accident, and you can't do it while you're running from one place to the other. You have got to say, this is important, I've got to set aside the time for this. In fact, studies have shown that to break a bad habit takes 21 days. That you need a process of at least 21 days in order to stop doing something you shouldn't be doing. Smoking cigarettes or, you know, sleeping in or whatever it is. You need to discipline yourself and after 21 days your system becomes adjusted and you no longer have the same level of desire to do that bad thing, right? Whatever it is. Likewise, to create a new habit, a good habit, hopefully, <laughs> seems like bad habits come immediately, but to create a good habit requires 21 days, the studies have shown. If you want to establish, like people say when you start exercising, to get in a habit of exercising so that it's not drudgery anymore, so that it's not, oh no, I hate this anymore, takes 21 days of doing it regularly. What that means is, if you're trying to break the habit of not having a personal devotional life, and you're trying to create the new habit of having a personal devotional life, it may take you 42 days. Half of that to stop being undevotional, and half to start committing yourself to a personal devotional life. It's going to take some time before this becomes natural to you. And that's what we're talking about with the 21 days, before something becomes natural. And for me, I used to hate getting on the treadmill, all right? Hate it, hate it, hate it. I've discovered the secret for me to enjoy the treadmill is Netflix. But <laughs> even then, it took me three weeks probably, right about three weeks, before I got to the point where I'd say, hey, I'm going to go get on the treadmill. Because that's, you know, that's good. I feel better. You know, I... I get to watch a movie, uh, you know, it's all good. Before I go, oh man, I don't want to do that. I've got all these other things I want to do. It took me time before that became something I wanted to do. The same thing is true with this. You have to make a commitment, and it's going to take some time. All right? Second thing is you have to establish your priorities. Truly, if you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there. You need to decide, what is this all about for me? What am I trying to do here? Now, I'm not, I'm not talking about read through the Bible in a year. This is not a quantitative issue, it's a qualitative issue. And I think the way to address it is very simply to write down in one paragraph what you want from a personal devotional life. What do you want to change for you by having a personal devotional life? And then write down 
what you think God wants for you in a personal devotional life. And the comparison of those two will be very interesting, I believe. So write down what you... See, almost all Christians would say, oh yes, I need to have a richer devotional life. I need to spend more time in prayer. I need to spend more time in Bible study. Okay? And for most, it doesn't happen. Let's face it. So part of the process is first commit yourself to it. That's number one. And number two, then decide why do you want that? Not just because somebody told you you should. Not just because Pastor Ross said this is a good idea. What is it in one paragraph that you want out of a personal devotional life? To feel closer to God? To feel like you hear His voice more clearly? To have a greater sense of how you can live out your Christian faith day to day? And not just when you're in classes or church? Whatever it is. What do you want out of a personal devotional life? And then write that paragraph again and say, what does God want for me in a personal devotional life? He wants to spend more time with me. He wants me to hear his voice more readily so that he can communicate with me more. He wants me to feel the support of his presence with me all the time in a way I don't feel right now all the time. Okay? Is that clear? So to establish your priorities, write one paragraph about what you want from a personal devotional life, and then a second about what you believe God wants for you to have in a personal devotional life. Fair? And then the third thing, which was closely related to number one, is finding the time. Anything you value must be given a priority. Set a devotional time, schedule it, and then keep it. Put it on your calendar. And I strongly recommend that it be the same time all the time. I'm going to talk in a few minutes about dailies and weeklies kind of commitments. But you need to have a time every day, we're going to talk about what's involved in this in a few minutes, every day where you have set aside time to be with God, to have your personal devotional time. And practice it, set it aside, it is sacrosanct, you, you don't change that, nothing interferes with that. We talked about this before. Anything that you value and enjoy, you'll set aside time for, and usually it will be the same time. When do you play golf again, Arnie? 7 o'clock in the morning. 7 o'clock in the morning, like Monday, Wednesday, Friday or something, right? Yes. Okay. So the same thing is true for this, to set aside time. Um, and it, it, it doesn't have to be one time. It's, it's, as I've mentioned before, I think that great harm has been done with those, those people who have taught, well, you have to get up and do this at 5 o'clock in the morning. For some people, 5 o'clock in the morning, they're zombies. They're not going to get anything out of this, you know? <laughs> And they go, okay, I'm going to start my devotional time at 5 in the morning, and I'll just do it here lying in bed with the lights off. Okay? What's that going to get you? A nap. A nap. Okay. More rested, but it's not going to improve your personal devotional life. Okay? It might be at 10 o'clock in the morning. It might be at lunchtime. It might be in the evening. That is the best time for you. Whatever is your best time, find it, set it, keep it. Put it on your schedule, and don't ever say, well, I, I really don't have time for that. You have darn well got as much time as I do or anybody else. We've all got exactly the same amount of time. When somebody says, well, I don't have time for that, that means I don't think that's important enough for me to make room for. That's all that means. And if you don't think this is important enough for you to make room for, you need to sit back and really hard rethink your priorities. Because we're talking about your relationship with God. But sometimes we have to take our second best time because my best time is your best time. And I would miss a lot of classes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> 10 well, o'clock in the morning is when I function good. Okay, 10 o'clock is when you function good? Well, okay. Um, I'm sure that right after that would be good then. All right. the, the, you have to find the time. Now, when I say, don't say you can't do this because you don't have time, you may have to juggle a little bit. That's what Rosie's saying. Particularly if you have kids. You know, there may be kids, kids need things when they need things. And so you may have, but the point is, find a time when you regularly are going to be able to attend to this and focus your energy on it, rather than say, well, I need to do that more, I'll just have to try to find time when I can. Because find time when you can is to not find time. Um, I had a fellow that I know who I believe is a great man of God, he was a pastor at church, and another, another friend of mine, a woman I was in seminary with, was his secretary for a while. And when she started being his secretary, he's a brilliant guy, PhD, um, wonderful. And so he was much in demand. He was teaching classes, he was pastor of church, you know, all kinds of stuff. 
on his calendar, my friend Marta, when she was, was his secretary, she noticed that like two or three times a day, he would have 15 minutes to a half an hour blocked off, and all it said was SBL. And so here she is trying to schedule all these other people that want some of his time, and she's working around this, and she finally says, can you help me here? I'm, I want to know where I've got some flexibility. What does SBL mean, and can I move that stuff? And he very quietly said, no, can't move that. That's absolutely locked in. And she said, well, what does it mean? And he said, stand before the Lord. Wow. Two or three times a day during the day, he set aside time to stand before the Lord. That was his devotional time, to pray, to listen, to study. I know who he is. I'm sure his Bible study time was all the time, pretty much, you know, as much as he was doing. But to set aside time and put it on your calendar, and if you've got a secretary, say, no, you can't mess with those times. Those are the times I stand before the Lord. That's... Christian maturity. And that's what we need to look for. Okay? Questions about that? Alright, the fourth element, which I believe is a practical element for devotional life, is finding a place. Similar to setting a time and locking it in, you need to have a place. Any place that is quiet and private will do, but you need to find a regular set place. It may be a quiet corner of a coffee shop or library at LCS or, you know, wherever works for you. It may, I, I know people who, they have a chair. And when they're seated in that chair, their family members know that that's the devotional time. I've known of one person who had a do not disturb sign they put on their, you know, on their room. And that, that to their family meant, I'm having devotions, don't bother me. Okay. I read one thing in preparation for this, there was a woman who had like seven kids, and she didn't have a place that she could get away, and she would put her apron over her head. And she'd be sitting at the dining room table with her apron over her head and her Bible in front of her, and her kids knew mom's having devotions. All right? As long as it is a place, and it is quiet, and it is private, and I'll talk about this in a minute, and you don't have music going, you don't have the TV on in the background. Oh, what a broken culture we are that we think we have to have sound all the time. Okay, I'll talk about that in a minute. But to find a place. So, you've, you've got to make the commitment. You've got to establish this as a priority. And understand what God's priority for it is. To find, to find time for it and to lock it in. To find a place where it's always your place. And I've told you all, for me... Every morning, get up, give the dogs their treat, make myself a cup of espresso. I sit on one end of the sofa, with, and my, my Bible is right there. That's where I have my devotions. Every morning. Maybe there are exceptions to that, you know, that I, I'm not in bondage. I don't, if I don't have devotions on a given morning, sometimes it's because I'm preparing a sermon or whatever, and I'm in the Word in a different way. And I'm not doing my usual morning devotions. But... Nine days out of ten, that's where I am in the morning. Okay? And that's easy for me. It's all right there. I don't have to think about it. I don't have to go, well, where am I going to go today? Well, where's my Bible? You know? Uh, what? What? I don't have time for this right now. No, I do. I've got a place. I've got my stuff there. I've got a time. It's not because I'm a saint. It's because I just did that. And anybody can do that. So find a place. Then you need to make a plan. And I, and I need to be careful about this. When I say make a plan, to have a Bible reading and study plan and a prayer list that focuses on God and your growth in Him, not on numbers. Having a plan does not mean I'm going to read through the Bible in a year. There is something inherently broken about that. Because you're establishing an artificial expectation that's not the point. The idea is to grow in the Lord, to grow in, in your relationship with Him. And if you're rushing to try to get a certain number of verses in, or you say um, that, that anything that's, that, that's based upon quantity and not quality, I'll get to that, devotional guidance, okay? Um, then, then you're making a mistake with it. But you do have to have some sense of what you're doing. For me, it's pretty simple. My, youth, my daily devotional kind of stuff is I work through the whole Bible. 
And so I have it marked and I pick up where I left off. For some of you, it will be that you want to focus on a book. You know, you're going to say, I want to study Romans or I want to study, you know, I'm going to read one psalm and then um, some of Paul every day. Whatever it is, you need some sort of general structure so that you've decided in advance what you're doing when you start your devotion so that you don't have to reinvent the wheel every time you sit down. You see my point? If every time you sit down you go, well, what am I going to do today? You'll spend the first 15 minutes trying to figure out where you are or what you're going to read or what you're going to do. And by the time you figured all that out, then you feel like you're done. And then you're going to do the same thing tomorrow. So have some sort of plan. If you want a Bible reading plan that will guide you through, I don't recommend one that's time oriented. Not one that says, you know, read the Bible in a year or whatever. But some sort of Bible reading plan, the uh, BibleGateway.com has them, Bible.com has them. Go on to Google and put in Bible reading plan and you will find a bazillion of them. And pick one that feels good to you. That will simply be, and then you print that out and you've got it there with your Bible at your usual place. And when you sit down, you... Mark through what you did last time, you know where you start, and then you can start. You don't spend all your time spinning your wheels trying to figure out what I'm going to do today. Okay? And then, you need to be prepared to overcome obstacles. There will be, no matter how hard you try to set this up, there will be interruptions, there will be distractions, some of them inside your own head. There will be noise, especially if you live in my street. Barking dogs and sound trucks. You don't say the guys. <laughs> Whatever it is, um, frustrations, lack of family support. Somebody comes in and goes, you know, Mom, Dad, I need you to do this right now. Mm -hmm. No, you don't. Remember devotion time. Okay, you have so a lack of family support. Perhaps even just not a, having a sense of fulfillment. You start this, and after a week or two weeks, even you're going. Oh, Boy, this is hard work. This is really frustrating. That's an obstacle. And there's two reasons that those obstacles occur. One is our human nature. The second is the devil doesn't want you doing this. The devil does not want you in God's Word praying, listening, seeking to be closer to the Lord, to hear His voice more clearly. And so he will do everything he can to throw stuff at you. But he's not the only spiritual power at work here when you run into those things, to ask God, Lord, help me center, help me focus, and start again. And if you have to do that early on, you will do that a lot, if you've never done this before. Early on, you will find yourself distracted and, and you know, troubled and interrupted, or whatever else it is, or frustrated, and you start again. You ask God to help you, and you start again. And then you get interrupted, and you Ask God to help you when you start again. And if for next time you need to make some other arrangements, like, okay, this location isn't working, I need to, you know, I need to get someplace else, whatever. But be prepared, know, because the devil is not happy when we do this, that there are going to be obstacles for you to overcome. And you can overcome them. Okay? And then keep a record. Journaling is one of the most powerful ways to grow. And it's one people hate. I can remember when I was in seminary and we were required to keep a journal. I hated it when I started. But that's the way you grow. And that's one of the ways God speaks to you. You've heard me say, I think in this class before, people learn in different ways. The things that you hear that come in through your ears are locked in one way. The things that come in through your eyes that you see are locked in another way. When you write, you use a different part of the brain. And you actually are anchoring things even more solidly when you write them. Um, Ron, right before this class today, he said that because they haven't been able to print out stuff, he's been writing them. And you said it's been really good, right, Ron? Right. You know, that, so you were, I assume you mean you were pulling stuff up on the screen, but because you couldn't print it, you were then, you were writing it out. Well, that will anchor it in your understanding, writing it down. So in this case, what we're talking about is um, you're reading scripture, you know, you pray, you read scripture, I'm going to get into the details of this in a minute, and you come across something that seems profound to you, or even something that's a question. You're reading along, and you get to something, the awareness that 1 Corinthians 13 is about God's love. 
You write that down. 1 Corinthians 13 is about God's love for us. And you date it. And then you go back. And you read until something else profound strikes you. All right? Something about Ruth or whatever it is that you're studying right there. And you write it down. And I've got here, try journaling in both directions. I'm going to talk about a prayer list in a minute. This is a brand new one because I just broke it out this morning. Moleskin. And, and uh, I use these all the time as... <laughs> as does my, my friend John here. When he found out how to moleskin, he got very excited. Um, these are nice because they've got a pocket in the back, and they, you know, self got a thing to close them with. I recommend journaling in both directions is that you take a book that's dedicated to journaling, and it can be, this can be spiral bound or whatever. It doesn't have to be the, the Bible study thing I recommend to be loosely. And you start in the front, and you make your journal notes as you go along. You know, October 26th. Um, 1 Corinthians 13, I realize that this is about the love of God for us, period. And you read some more until you find the next point. And you just make those notes. If there's a question, you write down a question. It may be something you follow up on later, or it may be something you just want to think about. And then, while you're doing this, you say, Lord, give me a greater understanding of this stuff. Help me understand. And you'll find later that when you're driving, you know, to pick up your dry cleaning, you go, well, you know what? I think that question that I had, maybe the answer is, this, because this stuff will start seeping into you. So when I see journal in both directions, do the uh, journaling in the first pages, you know, just follow it through like you would in ordinarily a book. And what I do is I go to the back page and I write my prayer list. And when I've filled up that, I go to the next pages. So my journaling is in the front, my prayer list is in the back. And the thing about a prayer list, and I'll mention this again in a minute, is that you do need to keep it updated. You need to, you know, as answers come or whatever, cross them off and add new things, where it becomes very tiresome after a while. You'll feel like you're just saying the same words over and over again. And I'll talk about prayer a little bit more in a minute. So many times you don't know when people get better. You know, well, there are people that you're praying for you don't know. That's true. And, and you know what? I think um, better that you, it's, it's okay to keep praying for people. C.S. Lewis. After he became quite famous as a Christian apologist and writer, his books, Chronicles of Narnia and Mere Christianity and the others were published and he, he was quite famous, people would write to him and ask him to pray for them. And Lewis kept a prayer list. When Lewis put someone on their prayer list, he never took them off, ever. He continued to pray for those people for the rest of his life, which you can imagine he probably had a pretty long prayer list. But he felt that that was what God called him to do. And so even if, some, even if somebody asked for prayer for healing or whatever, even if they got healed, he would continue to pray for them, for that person. And he would remember them in his prayers as he went along. I say that not by way of making us feel bad about our prayer lists, but simply because I think there's a lot more potential for us to continue in prayer for needs in the world than we, than we think we can. Can you pray for the whole list? Um, you, well, you mean just like... <laughs> Here it is, Lord, you know. <laughs> Something like that. Like that that's what some of the televangelists do. Uh, you know, they'll take all those prayer lists and pile them up in a bucket and go, okay, Lord, they're all yours, you know. Um, I don't recommend that. And I'll, because I'll talk about what prayer does in a minute, okay, and, and how to do it. So we'll get into that. So these, I think, are the seven things that I would say are the practical elements for a devotional life. Make the commitment. There is nothing more important than this. Establish your priorities. What do you want or need out of a devotional life? And what do you think God does? Third, find the time and lock it in. Fourth, find a place and have it established. Fifth, make a plan, just a general structure. What am I going to be doing here so that you don't spend all your time every day thinking of that? Overcome the obstacles as they arise and then keep a journal. Okay. We're going to take a break for a few minutes. It's uh, right now 2 o'clock. Let's take a 10-minute break and we will come back at 2.10. Uh, We'll talk about the realities of, of a devotional life, how you do it. Bible study. This devotional life is Bible study plus the other things that you need for this to be a spiritual exercise. A Bible study by itself can be an academic exercise. We are talking about making sure that it is something that is spiritual, that it affects you spiritually and not just that you gain knowledge. There's nothing wrong with gaining knowledge. Those things are advantageous. It is really important to gain knowledge a knowledge of the Bible. And I've said before, one of the first levels that you want to achieve is a basic understanding or a basic sense of what is in Scripture. 
and then you, you move on from there. But we're talking here about a devotional life, which is a basic understanding of Scripture and more, a, a, a growth spiritually in those things. The first reality I would say is that you need to start with modest expectations. If you have never done um, devotional study or had a personal devotional life before, then don't start out with expectations that are unrealistic or you just set yourself up just for discouragement. If you start out and say, okay, I'm going to spend three hours a day in Bible study and prayer, then you're probably going to get discouraged unless you have a long history of discipline in this sort of thing. Some people I know of have said that they want to have a tithe of devotional life, which means take one-tenth of all of their time, which would be 2.4 hours or 2 hours and 24 minutes a day. You've got to be ready before you do something like that, and if you try to jump into the deep end before you're really sure you know how to swim, then you're liable to sink. So my recommendation is you start with modest expectations. If it's 20 minutes a day, like 20 to 30 minutes a day may be where you want to start. Not, And I'm not saying that because the amount of time is critical. It's not. I told you in my devotional time, I go until I feel like, that's good, that's enough for today. And I, I don't know how much time it is. I mean, if you ask me, I'm sure that there are times I spend 20 minutes and there are times I spend two hours. And again, not because I'm especially pious, but because I this is a pattern for me and I don't really worry about it and don't think about it that much. But for you, it's better to set a limit and say, I'm going to do this for 20 to 30 minutes and give yourself permission to stop then rather than feel like you've got to go a long time and get frustrated with the whole process. Okay? So start out with modest expectations and then that will build over time as you develop your spiritual muscles for this kind of thing. And you really do grow into this. It doesn't happen all the once. The second thing is, understand that there will be obstacles. As I said before, the devil is not happy when you try to do this. And no matter, um, no matter how many obstacles you feel are in your way, you simply start again. I can almost promise you two things. I can almost promise you one thing. I can promise you a second thing. The thing I can almost certainly promise you is that you will feel like you're failing at this fairly often at first. You will feel like you're not getting traction. I'm not really growing. This doesn't feel good. It doesn't feel spiritual. You will feel like you're failing at this. Expect that because your spiritual muscles may not be ready for this yet and it takes some time. If, if you've never lifted weights before and you go to a machine and you start trying to lift weights, you're going to feel like a failure. You're going to feel like a weakling because you haven't done it before. But if you continue with it, if you start again, try again, you keep doing it long enough, then you build up the muscles and it starts feeling not only more natural, but better and better and even enjoyable after a while. But it doesn't start that way. So expect that you're going to feel like you failed quite often. That's the thing I can pretty much promise you. The thing I can absolutely promise you is that if you will stick with this, no matter how it feels, you will grow in the Lord. You will grow in your relationship with God. You will become more Christ-like. I promise you. And I promise you because He promised you. Okay. Um, I, I thought about giving you a ton of scriptures about this, and I, I decided I didn't really need to, but Psalm 1, you know, um, Blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of the sinners, nor sits in the seat of the, seat of the scornful, but what? His delight is in the law of the Lord, and in His law He meditates both day and night. The law of the Lord is Scripture. Right? That's the Jewish expression for the Bible. But His delight is in the law of the Lord, and in His law He meditates both day and night. Well, you don't start out meditating day and night from day one. But you start, and the longer you're at it, the more natural it is, the more satisfying it is, the better you will get at it and the more you grow. But expect that it's going to feel awkward, there are going to be obstacles, there are going to be times you want to just stop. Don't stop. Okay? Third, it will sometimes feel like hard work. Well, especially the prayer stuff, it will almost always feel like hard work. But you know what? Any relationship, especially any relationship that's really worth having, is work. 
If you, if you don't believe that having a relationship is work, then you've never had a relationship. Duh. Okay. It is work. And especially the prayer part. And I'm going to get into that in a little bit more detail. Fourth, your goals should include moving from reading, to just reading the Bible or even studying the Bible, to hearing God's voice in Scripture and interacting with it. I don't think most Christians really have a sense that this is the voice of God. This is God speaking to us. And when you read this, you are listening to the voice of God. And so the goal is to get to the place where not only are you aware that this is God's voice for you, to you and for you, but that you're interacting with it. You're pondering it. You're absorbing it. You're asking questions of it. That's the part, the interacting part, is where you're trying to get. Now understand that um, when we say that it's more than just reading the Bible or more than even studying the Bible, there have been a number of God's great servants down through the centuries who were illiterate. Or, even more common, didn't have a copy of the Bible for themselves. The idea of having a personal copy of the Bible or having two or three is a very new idea. And in fact, in many parts of the world, that's still not possible. And so, the, you'll get to the place where even if what scripture you know, or have access to, now in our case, there, there's no excuse for that, but if you were in a situation where your access to scripture was limited, the focus is on interacting with it and absorbing it. You know, places where they have one copy of the Bible and they will tear the pages out and they'll exchange the pages and spend time, a lot of time, just on the passages on that one page. That inherently is a very different approach than, okay, I need to read five chapters a day or I'm going to get behind on my reading plan. You get that? So, interacting with the scripture, letting it become part of you, meditating on the law day and night, if you will. That's the principle that the Jews taught um, in the Old Testament. And it's one that still holds today. The fifth thing is you need to plan your devotional life this should be life, not like. Plan your devotional life in terms of daily and weekly commitments. All right? What do I mean by that? Um, the Bible study techniques or approaches that we've been looking at in this class, inductive Bible study, topical Bible study, and then the ones that you all were working on, biographical or chapter analysis or whatever, um, those are not things you're going to do every day. Right? You're not going to sit down and do a character, a biographical character study every day. But you should be in God's Word every day. So the difference between daily and weekly commitments is you need to have um, every day a time and a place set aside and a plan, a Bible reading plan. And if you don't have one, go online and print one off. You can find a million of them. That you're reading, you're thinking, you're pondering, you're absorbing, you're meditating on, you're writing in your journal about. And then once a week, and do that four or five days a week at least. I recommend Monday through Friday. And then sometimes, Saturday or maybe Sunday afternoon, after church and lunch, then sit down and spend a couple of hours doing a much more intensive kind of Bible study for content. An inductive study, a topical study, that's your weekly. Your dailies are reading through according to your Bible plan, Meditating on it, letting it sink in, asking questions of it, making notes, your, your weekly, your daily prayer uh, list from your, the back of your journal. That's your dailies. Do that every day. That's what you do for starting out, 20 minutes to a half an hour. Later on, however much time you feel like is a blessing to you and honoring to God. And then once a week, and it may be that you do this one night of the week. It may be that you do this on Wednesday afternoons or whatever. Find one time during the week when you do a much more intentional kind of Bible study using the inductive method or the topical method or one of the other things we've studied about. Where you're really getting into the meat of understanding the details behind and the context and all those kinds of things. Right? <clears throat> context, observation, um, it just went blank. Observation, meditation, application, kinds of stuff, so that you're putting all of that into, um, into your understanding, your grid. That idea of a grid where you're gaining Christian maturity that allows you to interact with things in the world and understand whether they're of God or not. Okay? 
Is that clear? That's the dailies and weeklies kind of thing. You should be doing something every day. Now, for some people, Sunday, their Sunday morning worship is their thing to do that day. But Sunday afternoon, since Sunday is a day when ideally we set aside for both rest and for the things of God, Sunday afternoon is a great time to do your weeklies, where you do the weekly Bible study. There are some other things that you can do, I think, that, that are really beneficial. Um, Charles Stanley, every morning when he wakes up, you know who Charles Stanley is, Dr. Mm -hmm. Charles Stanley? Uh, pastor, minister, Bible teacher, writer. He says every morning when he wakes up, in his mind, he goes through the process of putting on the full armor of God. You know, the full armor of God from Ephesians 6, starting with verse 11. The full armor of God is the belt, and it says, you know, arm yourself with the belt of truth, with the breastplate of righteousness, with your feet fitted with the readiness from the gospel of peace, with the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And so Charles Stanley says that when he wakes up in the morning, and it's a great idea when we wake up in the morning if we, if we can develop the habit of waking up with prayer. Okay? Just silent prayer, if nothing other than thanking God for another day. But I really like this idea, and I think I may start doing this, of just say, Lord, equip me today. You're the one who you said you wanted me to be equipped with the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, my feet fitted ready with the gospel of peace, uh, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, the sword of spirit, which is the word of God. Dress me in those things today that I might be your servant wearing your armor. I think that's great. Okay? Ephesians 6.11, look that up. So those are the daily and weekly commitments. Now, and you're saying, that's a lot. You know what? It's not. <laughs> this is a fraction of what most people spend watching television every day. And what's more important? Okay? Um, eat out a couple times more a week so you don't have to spend as much time cooking. I don't know. Find the time. This is important. Number six, don't forget to pray. Now, there are two reasons why we need to pray. The first one is the one everybody always thinks about, and that is to ask God for the things that we need in our life. God has told us to come before Him and ask for the things we need. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, let your requests be made known unto God. Philippians. God told us to bring our needs to Him, the things that we want to ask Him for and need to ask Him for. So that's one reason we pray. But the second reason why we pray very consistent with it, this whole theme of de devotional life, is in order for God to change us. Because as we come to God and we talk with Him and we listen to Him, which is the part of prayer very few people really practice, God changes us. Again, C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis said, prayer does not change God. Prayer changes me. As I come before the presence of God, it's not like I'm talking Him into something. But God uses that prayer to help me be what I need to be, to help me understand. So we need to pray for those reasons. And First Thessalonians, the passage that uh, Kina, you were no, you were talking about, uh, Rosie, mm -hmm. pray without ceasing. We need to have times of concerted prayer where we are very focused in our prayer. But then we also need to be prepared, and you'll develop this habit over time. As you go through your life and, and some moron does something really stupid driving, you know, pray that they don't get killed before they get home, okay? One of the things I've discovered, I get very impatient with other drivers who do dumb things. It's one of my problems. One of the things that I've discovered is when I keep my head about me and I'm wise enough to pray for them, not pray that they, you know, learn a lesson, you know, that I don't that. when I actually pray for them to be blessed, I find I can't continue to feel angry or upset at them if I am praying for them. And I don't mean praying to clench teeth. You know? <laughs> that makes a difference for me, okay? Um, praying, you know, if you're stuck in a line at the market, pray for the checkout person. Um, for the gal with the coupons. For the gal with the coupons, whatever it is. <laughs> Do, that will come with time, and that's something you need to look forward to, where as you go through life, somebody once called those uh, you know, bullet prayers or arrow prayers, where you just shoot one off, okay? Um, and that's good. That's not enough by itself. We need to have a time of more concerted prayer where we're listening to God more. 
But the idea is that when we pray, we have conservative time of prayer, we have um, the arrow prayers or bullet prayers. It's also a good idea that we have kind of an order in our prayers. Uh, that we, and I've got up here ACTS. Are you all familiar with the ACTS prayer? It's a little acronym which, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm not one who's real keen on it, too many acronyms because it's too cutesy. I really like Rick Warren. I really like his stuff. But Rick Warren has a habit, no matter what he does, it has to all start with the same letter. It has to be an acronym or something. And I want to go, Rick, 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 buddy, we're adults. Come on now, you know? But he does. The ACTS one really works for me. ACTS stands for four kinds of prayer that you should include. The first one is adoration. The second one is confession. The third is thanksgiving. And the fourth is supplication, which means asking for the things that you need or want. Okay. Now, how alert are you all to come to our church? What's, what's the first thing we do after I do the announcements? We pray. The prayer of? Adoration. 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 Okay. We have someone else come up not long after that, and, and what do they do? The prayer of confession. Prayer of confession. And then, before we get to the pastoral prayer, I usually will have a time of thanksgiving before I get to supplication. So, without announcing it as the Acts prayer, I try to make sure that we incorporate all of this stuff into our services. And we need to incorporate this into our own prayer life. Adoration for God. Confession of our sins and our unworthiness, that He still loves us. Thanksgiving for all the wonderful blessings that He has given us. And then, pray for the things that you need. Okay? Now... Adoration is not something that most people today are comfortable with. It means to worship God, to praise God. It means to simply articulate that God is great. Now, most people, again, they start saying this even to themselves, and they feel awkward about it. God, you are great. You are worthy to be praised. You are a great and mighty God who has shown your love through all generations. That's... How, that's what adoration means. And I have a recommendation for you if you have trouble with that. And that is to take one of the psalms of worship and praise. And to read it as the first part of your prayer. And let me give you a few. Here are just a few of the psalms. And by the way, here's one of those cases where you can go to Google and type in psalms of praise. And you'll find them listed for you. There'll be people who talk about them. But for example, Psalm 92... Psalm 95, Psalm 98, Psalm um, 100, 103, 107, 117, 145, 147. Go to any one of those and you will read a psalm and, and read it and own it for yourself as your words. They're declarations of the greatness and the glory of God of the fact that He alone is really worthy of our praise. Use the Psalms for that for a while until you begin to feel comfortable with it to put in your own words. Okay? So start with that adoration. Then confession. As simple as saying, Lord, I don't come to you praying because I am worthy of being heard, but rather because you have loved me. Okay? You have expressed your love for me when I wasn't worthy. And please forgive me for my sins. And then be specific about that. You know, whatever sins that you, you feel. And during our prayer of confession, we have a moment of silence where people can, in the silence of their own hearts, pray a confession for their own sins. So confession is the second part. The third part is thanksgiving, which is exactly what it sounds like. What do you have to be thankful for? I thought it was so funny. Jacques Pepin, you know the chef, Jacques Pepin? I cook, and so I watch the cooking show sometimes when I can um, Jacques Bopal was a close friend of Julia Child, and he's a French chef who actually lives in Mexico now, and he's working on, on, com on combining French and Mexican culinary things. Jacques Bopal, I heard him interviewed one time, and he said that, because uh, he lived in the United States for most of his life, even though he's still got a very strong French accent, he said that um, his favorite holiday of all the American holidays was Thanksgiving, because it was the one that had absolutely no religious overtones. <laughs> Jock, 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 who are you thanking? Okay? We need to recognize that all of the blessings of our life are gifts from God. Every, the, the dominant expression of our life should be gratitude. 
This is one of the other big things that, that Chesterton was about. He talked about, we should give thanks for marigolds and post boxes and clouds and trees and children and, you know, a, a comfortable chair and a good cup of tea and on and on and on. All of those things are things to thank God for. If you have trouble thinking of things to thank God for, then you need to start thinking harder. Because <laughs> there's a whole lot out there to thank Him for, okay? So thanksgiving. And then finally, supplication, which simply means to ask for the things that you need. I would recommend that in a time of supplication that you start with praying for other people first. <laughs> there's too much of a tendency in our culture to start with me. You know, in fact, that they, most people, their definition of prayer would be to say, okay, Lord, what I really need right now is that new car or whatever it is. That should come way down. That should be the last part of what you pray for. Even when you get to the prayer time of supplication, ask for others first. Ask for things in the larger world. For those places where there is oppression and injustice. And if you know specific ones, fine. If you pray generally, fine. Pray for wisdom to care for creation that God has given us. Pray for the church. Especially in places where the church is persecuted where it is very difficult to profess the name of Jesus. And for the church here at Lakeside, and for you know the church meaning the, the whole manifestation of the body of Christ, and sort of work your way down until you get to you. And then be honest about telling the Lord what you need. Try to be a little discerning about what you need versus just what you want. I mean, God is not against you telling him what you want, but if everything that you want is new and electronic, then there's probably a problem. Okay. <laughs> Um, but you can pray for the things that you need and want as well. Any questions about that? Okay. The Acts prayer. Adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication. And I say try praying out loud. Don't do this sitting on a, bar, a park bench because somebody might throw a net over you. Um, but if you have a quiet, private place, and especially if you're struggling with your prayer life, try praying out loud. Because sometimes when you pray out loud, you also hear your own voice. And sometimes that helps keep you on track. It helps you concentrate. If you find yourself trying to pray and your mind is wandering, for instance, that's a good time to try praying out loud. Because praying out loud, as you hear what you're saying, it keeps you focused. And it... it expands the experience. Anytime you can add an additional sense to what's going on, that is a sensory part of it, then that's an advantage. I, I, I don't have this written here, but you might try praying by kneeling or by lifting your hands. I'm not trying to be overly charismatic, but you all know what um, psychosomatic illness is, right? It's where the connection between your mind and your body, it means that you get your body literally gets sick because your mind is convinced that you're sick. My point in that is there really is a relationship between what happens inside you and what you do with your physical body. Okay? Uh, the placebo effect is another example of that, where they give people sugar pills because they think it's going to help. It helps. What you do with your, your uh, mentally and spiritually affects your body. Well, what you do with your body affects your spirit. And so try, try kneeling. Try raising your hands. Don't get crazy about this. I'm not suggesting painful yoga positions necessarily. But to, to achieve, to, to seek an attitude of reverence before the Lord. Um, there are, I know, I know very, very fine uh, people I really respect for their faith who will spend time praying face down on the floor. You know, to literally fall before the Lord and pray to pray directly recognition of his holiness. Now, they don't do it to beat themselves up. That's not the point. But simply, by doing something with your body, it can make a difference in terms of how your spirit responds. Okay? Is that fair? Yeah, except when you're as old as I am, you can't get back up. <laughs> <laughs> well, just make sure, Rusty, when you get down, you've got a bell, and that Arnie's close enough to hear it. <laughs> All right. Um, then, learn to worship God. This is the praise and adoration part of the prayer. But I, I, I mention it several here because it is something that you probably need to, to really be aware of because it's something that most people are, have difficulty with because they don't usually experience that 
And then again, and yet again, if you read the Psalms, this was a fundamental part of the Jewish understanding of what worship was. To spend time in praise and adoration. To praise God for his greatness, to adore him for all that he has done in his mightiness for us. Okay? Then learn to listen. I'm actually put two of these up. Learn to listen and learn to appreciate the silence. Um, prayer cannot be just you talking all the time, or it's not really prayer. It's a monologue. So part of what it means to pray effectively is to take time to listen. And when I said appreciate silence, don't have the radio on, don't have the TV on, don't, you know, as much as possible be in a quiet place. Because you all know the, um, you know, scripture, the idea that God was not in the earthquake and God was not in the great fire and God was not in the mighty wind, and yet the still small voice was where God made himself known. Well, it's very hard to hear a still, small voice. You've got the radio on, or the TV turned up, okay? So we need to learn to listen to God. And part of this is say, Lord, teach me what you desire for me to know. And, so, and one of the things I recommend is that as you pray, you have pauses. One of the things that makes me crazy about God, uh, in terms of quite often, if, if there's a problem or something, I find that I will say, you know, Lord, I need for you to resolve this problem and to, you know, to help do something about this. And if I stop there, quite often, not always, but quite often, a thought will come into my mind. And it will be something like, well, why don't you do something about it? <laughs> or it might be something more specific than that. And I've come to believe that that's God speaking to me. That that is the still small voice. Um, there was a, you remember Pogo, the cartoon Pogo? There was a great Pogo one time, and it was two of the characters sitting up on the limb of a tree, and one of them says, you know, I went to God and I said, God, there's all this pain in the world and hunger and people killing each other and children who don't have anything to eat, and the world is such a messed up place and there's so much hurt out there, and why don't you do something about it? The other character said, and what did God say? He said, God said the same thing to me. <laughs> okay. Talk about deep. Well, sometimes if we just pause as we're praying and listen, God may tell us what, we, what we're looking to hear. But you have to listen. You have to be quiet sometimes. This isn't mystical. This isn't magical. This is the nature of, the kind of having a relationship where you talk and then you shut up and you listen. How can I have a relationship with my wife if I did all the talking and never gave her a chance to say anything to me? Now, don't you start, you two. Okay? We have to be prepared to listen. Yes. And I honestly think that if we listen, that God will speak to us in those ways. And sometimes he tells me that I... That he gives me answers I don't particularly want to hear. But I have to take them seriously because I ask. So this, and this is serious business. We're talking about talking to God of the whole universe. Okay. Number 10, uh, learn the power of keeping a written journal. I've suggested what I call journaling in both directions. Write down the profound, the things that strike you as profound, they don't have to be earth shattering to somebody else, but if they're profound to you, the questions that you might have, the, and it may be that you write in a part of the scripture or a scripture that was especially meaningful to you, the very act of writing it down can be very powerful. And then later on, you'll be able to come back, you know, maybe once a week or so, and you reread some of the notes. As you write those things and think about them, it may be that God gives you answers to those things as you go along, and writing them will be the thing that sort of anchors them in your mind, because you not only are using your hand, but you're also with your eyes, you're being aware of that, more so than just thinking about it. So keeping a written journal is a powerful thing, and it's always been considered one of the basic Christian disciplines, spiritual disciplines, is to write a journal. I don't expect that you all are going to, you know, be Anne Frank, or... You know, some, or Dietrich Bonhoeffer's journals, or something that's going to shape the world, and that's not why you're doing it. You're not writing this stuff for publication. You're writing it simply as an expression of your relationship with God and what He is teaching you, showing you, even questions that He's bringing into your mind. 
and it's a useful tool. Okay? And then 11, use other writers' devotional ideas only as a secondary source. Bob, you held up the devotional back there. I don't have a problem with using devotional guides. I don't think that should be your first tier. We actually hand out devotional guides in our, our new visitors' bags. The fact is because most of those people are not going to take you know, eight weeks of two hours of lecture in order to learn how to study the Bible better like you guys have. But um, I don't think that for somebody who really wants to do it, it's better than nothing. Okay? And for many people, it gives them sort of a start. I don't think using a devotional guide should be the first thing you do. It may be that as you develop your devotional life, you have your own, you know, your own study, you're reading the scripture, uh, meditating on it, praying, as we've talked about, journaling, and maybe at the end of the time, most of the devotionals are available. You can read them in 90 seconds. You know, it's it's 15 lines of type. Maybe you read that, and maybe that becomes just a, a seed that God helps grow you over a period of time by that as well. I don't have any problem with that. But that can't be, for some people, it's like, Okay, I, I just read the devotional guide for the day. I can go now, all right? And that's it. That's not the point. For most people, the devotional guide does not become a way to really grow in your personal devotional life in the way that you need to. So I don't have a problem with them per se, but you guys are better than that. You can go beyond that. Those that's that's devotional, you know, kindergarten. And you guys are ready for college, all right? That's what I have for today. Any questions about any of that? This is where the rubber meets the road for everything else you've learned in the last six weeks. This is where it becomes not just learning, but growing. And you apply all the things that you've learned so far about how to study the Bible with, a, with a, that being a, a fundamental part of your growth in personal devotional life. But if you learned how to study the Bible, every technique that's in, in um, the Rick Warren book, if you did every exercise, even the different colors and the symbols and everything in the K. Arthur book, if you could quote the whole topical Bible and none of that draws you closer to the Lord, it would have been a waste. That's the difference between this instituto and most seminaries. Is I don't really care how much you learn if you don't apply it to your growth in the Lord, because that's the point. I want you to learn all of it, and to be completely comfortable with all the content that we're teaching and that you're, you're trying to learn, but then that you also learn how to apply that to your own relationship with God. Okay? That's, the, that's the real point. Right. You know, I, I'd really, really like to say this, this is one lecture that I intend to send to my children and to all my Christian friends and say Christian life is more than simply going to church on Sunday. And here is one two-hour video that can give you direction in your personal life to find the life in Christ that you would like to share. Good, and if it's if it's of help to them, I can ask for nothing more. I mean, that's I, that's. I think uh, I think it was an amazing lecture. Okay. Any other questions? I'm not asking for endorsements beyond that. But <laughs> Your assignment for next week, study for the exam. And I do recommend, now again, is there anyone who, who uh, cannot get to the material or print them out? You all need a copy of it, uh, Harrington's? No, we got one, thank you. You got one, and you have the late last week as well? Today? I think so. Okay, okay. Um, if you have one, I've got, I think I've got some printed on there. No, I can print some out, so I'll do that. Uh, anything else? Michael. Is there a place locally where you get that? Uh, Moleskins? Um, you can probably get them at a good bookstore in Guadalajara because these things are really international. But they're called Moleskins. Um, and they're, they really are. They, they began as a journal like the, the Americans in Paris, you know, back in the Hemingway days and all that. But they became popular back then. Somebody, uh, these I got in San Antonio when I was there. You know, I'll, I'll pick up two or three or four every time I'm back in the States, and we're back in the States several times a year. So, um, you can, M O L E S K I N E. Or S K, yeah, I think it is E. Yeah. So it looks like Moleskine. Oh, right. Thanks, everybody.
We'll see you next week.